Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. This is your Linux and free software news roundup for the month of May. May the 1st. DuckDuckGo has proposed a Do Not Track Act of 2019. What they mean by that is simple. They drafted a legislation idea that would enforce the Do Not Track setting in users' browsers and force websites to comply with it. As of today, they announced that one out of four people have enabled this setting in their browser and that the vast majority of the internet chooses to ignore it. If they have their way, this would mean that, for users with DNT enabled, websites could no longer use third-party tracking or even first-party tracking outside of what's reasonable and understandable by the user. I strongly support this move, obviously. May the 4th. Apart from being Star Wars Day, Ubuntu closed down its merch shop. It sold stuff like t-shirts, mugs, USB keys, messenger bags, of course all branded with the Ubuntu or Canonical logo. While the company didn't offer a reason for such a shutdown, I'm willing to bet that sales were pretty slow and the management of inventory even limited and shipping just wasn't that interesting for Canonical and Ubuntu as a whole. A glitch broke all of Firefox's extensions for a while. I might be pro-Firefox and firmly opposed to Chrome, but this kind of problem just can't happen. The short story here is that each Firefox add-on has to be signed to avoid malicious software picking up on a user's data. Turns out, one of the certificates that Firefox used to authenticate most extensions had expired, thus flagging all extensions as legacy and disabling them. An update fixed the issue less than a day later, but this is still an interesting incident. Finally, on the same day, DXVK 1.1.1 has been released, bringing version 1.1 back after it was pulled due to widespread issues. It should bring enhancements to frame timing to enable more consistent and smooth FPS as well as triple buffering. Memory usage should be lowered for games using a lot of shaders, and Unreal Engine 4 titles should also see a bunch of improvement performance-wise as long as you use Wine 4.5 or Proton 4.2 and the very latest drivers from Nvidia or AMD and Intel. 5th of May. The Linux kernel version 5.1 has been released, bringing support for Model A Plus of the Raspberry Pi 3, some Intel Wi-Fi hardware, as well as better support for AMD Vega GPUs. A new interface also has been added for improving input-output speed called IO Euring. All in all, a modest release as hardware support and features go. 6th of May. Microsoft has announced their second version of their Windows subsystem for Linux, which allows to run Linux executables on Windows, and most importantly run Linux command lines directly from Windows. This new version brings better speed for file system operations, which should reduce the subsystem boot time. It also allows running Linux Docker containers bypassing the need for virtual machines. It should be available in mid-June. To enable all of this, Microsoft will ship a Linux kernel directly with Windows. First builds will ship a tuned-up version of version 4.19, and this will be later updated through Windows Update. Yeah, you heard right, Microsoft will update a Linux kernel in Windows through Windows Update. Things are getting weird. To complement this new subsystem, Microsoft will launch Windows Terminal. It's a complete revamp of the older terminal utility and seems to regroup the command prompt, PowerShell and the Windows subsystem for Linux. This terminal will be available from the Windows Store and feature tabs, GPU rendered text or profile support. It is also surprisingly open source and the code can be cloned from GitHub right now. Microsoft really seems to take an interest in Linux and open source lately and I'm still undecided on the matter. Whether it's a good or bad thing for the Linux ecosystem, one can only appreciate the efforts Microsoft is making to be a better member of the various development communities. 8th of May. D9VK 0.1 has been released officially, allowing to use Vulkan to run DirectX 9 games. Previously, these games depended on Wine's implementation of DirectX, which could lead to performance issues. D9VK still lacks a few features to be a full replacement, but it's starting to be able to run games pretty well. Lutris installers might start to take advantage of it soon, for games where it can bring better performance. Ninth of May. At Google I.O., the web giant announced that all Chromebooks will also be Linux laptops going forward. Google showed how it was possible to run Linux applications directly on a Chromebook. Chrome OS was always based on Linux, but showed a very specific interface based mostly on their web browser. This won't work as a dual boot, instead your laptop will run both OS's at the same time. This means that files available in Chrome OS can be opened by a Linux app running on your distro of choice, itself running in a container. Performance might not be all that great though, since these machines usually are underpowered, and running an OS in a VM can really detract from overall performance. 
Still, this might put Linux applications in the hands of a lot more people, especially since Chromebooks are becoming an interesting proposition, being able to run web apps, Android applications, and now regular Linux desktop apps. 10th of May. Wine 4.8 has been released, bringing 38 bug fixes, most notably for Star Citizen, World of Warships, Planet Side 2, Grand Prix Legends, Test Drive Unlimited, and Warframe. It also improves joystick support and supports MSI patch files. As always, it's good to see such interest and rapid progress on Wine. In related news, BattleEye announced that they are working with Valve to bring support for their anti-cheat software to Steam Play. Their previous position was that they only could support Linux through their native Linux software, so it's interesting to see that they seem to have changed their stance on the issue. One major title using the service is PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, or most Arma 3 servers, so if the thing goes through, interested gamers will be able to play their favorite title through Steam and Proton. 12th of May D9VK version 0.11 was released, improving quickly on its 0.1 release just a few days earlier. It brings a lot of features and fixes, such as a rewritten buffer code to correct memory errors and improve performance, and shadows and textures should now be displayed correctly in a number of games. We'll have to wait for this new tool to be incorporated in Steam Play or Lutris installers, but it's exciting to see this project moving forward quickly, as it should enable better performance for older DirectX 9 games on Linux. 13th of May DXVK saw another release, version 1.2, with improvements on games which tax the CPU a lot, with other changes improving the GPU utilization. The first groundwork also has been laid to implement some DirectX 11 extensions. A few bug fixes should also improve how Mirror's Edge Catalyst runs with DXVK. 14th of May Valve released Proton 4.2-4, bringing fixes for Rage 2, updating the 1.1.1 of DXVK, and improving Vulkan support for the new No Man's Sky Vulkan build. To complement this, Valve also released a new beta of SteamOS, its own Linux distro. While there is nothing spectacular in this release, and it's more aimed at their beta testers, it brings a few package updates, security fixes, and new firmware versions. 15th of May Mark Shuttleworth, founder of Canonical and Ubuntu, had a talk with TFIR on why Linux on the desktop failed. The video interview is pretty interesting, with Shuttleworth pointing out that the Linux desktop never really put forward what it did better than other OSs for end users, and never really invented something that was really ahead of its time. He points out that they tried to bring such a vision with convergence and unity, but that the community didn't let them move forward in that direction, since it wasn't what they were expecting from a Linux desktop. He admits they failed for a lot of reasons, and that many of these were their own, but also points out that the backlash against Unity was undeserved, and I can't agree more with him on that topic. 16th of May Valve pushed a new beta of its Steam client, fixing crashes when launching games or when copying files bigger than 2GB. Steam will now use its own version of Curl instead of the one shipped on the system, preventing errors in Risk of Rain and other Game Maker titles. More interestingly, developers and Valve can now test specifying some default Proton configuration options even without whitelisting the title. This means developers should be able to test more easily if their game can be made to work and optimized with Proton before opening it officially to all users. Finally, this updates bring the ability to download Vulkan shaders as a regular Steam download, instead of downloading them directly while the game is running. Steam will also gain the ability to pre-compile these shaders in a future beta build. In less technical terms, it means that, in the near future, we should see an end to the various stutters in games running with Vulkan, including those running through DXVK. The KDE Plasma 5.16 beta has been released, with a ton of improvements to the desktop experience. Highlights include an entirely new notification system with a new settings panel to configure them, as well as support for Do Not Disturb mode, and the work on the settings panels has been extended, with more consistency across the whole Appearance tab. Touchpads can now be configured using libinput, provided you're using x.org, and initial support for the proprietary NVIDIA driver on Wayland has been added. Discover, the KDE package manager, has also received a bunch of updates to make installing apps a bit easier. You can already try out the beta using the instable version of KDE Neon, and of course I'll cover all these changes in a dedicated video when the new version is out. 19th of May DXVK 1.2.1 has also been released, 6 days after version 1.2, fixing a few issues and optimizing performance for some games, including The Surge, Lords of the Fallen, or Yakuza Kiwami 2. May 21st 
Purism reached its goal for its Librem 1 suite of privacy-conscious applications and services. They now have more than 5,000 backers in about two weeks, and that proves there is a growing interest for more ethical services. We'll have to wait and see how that grows and evolves, but this can only be seen as a victory, even if a small one, for open source software on which their suite is based, and for privacy in general. Firefox also released version 67 of its web browser, featuring improved performance. To deliver this, Firefox will now suspend idle tabs if your available RAM goes under 400 megabytes, and prioritizing scripts over less needed features when loading web pages. They tout a 40 to 80% improvement in speed for Instagram, Amazon, and Google search scripts. This new version also allows users to enable fingerprinting and crypto mining protection directly from the settings. This should avoid malicious websites using your CPU to mine cryptocurrencies and should also prevent companies from building a hardware profile of your computer to be able to track you without your consent. Finally, Firefox 67 allows you to save passwords and decide which extensions you'd like to enable in private browsing mode. The toolbar should now be more accessible through the keyboard and the AV1 video decoder has been improved to enable smoother and faster video playback. Firefox 67 should already be available in your distro's repos and you should definitely update. In sadder news, after 7 years the Entergos distribution is shutting down. The Arch-based distro had gathered around 1 million downloads since 2004, but the team lacked the time to properly maintain the project and decided to stop before it became detrimental to its users. Existing Entergos users will keep getting updates directly from Arch and the AUR, and the specific Antergos repos will be moved to avoid leaving old and maintained packages in the wild. It's always sad to see a project shutting down, especially one that did much to make Arch more accessible. Users of Antergos might want to take a look at Manjaro, which keeps the same accessibility and simple spirit with an Arch base. May 23rd. GitHub launched a new feature called Sponsors, aimed at letting users of an open source project reward the developer directly from their GitHub repository. Developers will have the opportunity to opt in and add a Sponsor Me button in their GitHub repo, and payments will be free for at least 12 months. During the first year, any contribution will be matched by GitHub up to $5,000. The program is currently behind a waitlist, but I expect GitHub will roll it out pretty quickly. I think it's a great idea that will bring more opportunities for open source developers to be rewarded for their work. Obviously, we'll have to see if the community reacts positively, since there are already a few avenues letting developers earn money for their open source projects, but being integrated directly into GitHub, it does give it a bit more visibility. Another beta of the Steam client for Linux was also released, fixing bugs in the Steam overlay with games using Vulkan, as well as a bug that prevented Rumble from working in Steam input controllers, including the Steam controller itself. Apparently, this bug required to work around a Linux kernel bug, for which a patch has been submitted upstream. Although it is nice to see this implemented, user reports on gaming on Linux seem to indicate that it still doesn't work on every game and can be glitchy at times. May 24th. Steam Play was updated again with Proton 4.2-5. While a smaller version than usual, it updates its DXVK to version 1.2.1, only 5 days after its release, and fixes multiple control layout issues in Unity and Ubisoft titles. The Steam networking APIs are now supported as well, and this should fix issues notably in Ahead in Time. You should get it automatically through Steam if you have Steam Play enabled. May 25th. Many GTK application developers signed an open letter on the GTK theming topic, asking distributions to stop theming their applications and changing their icons. While I do understand some of the points they make, most notably on the branding side of things, I can't say I agree much with what was written here. Changing a default icon and tinkering with the branding the app developer has established is definitely something that should be reconsidered, even though users are free to do what they like. But the application's theme is a capability that should be maintained, and I don't know many people willing to use a disjointed desktop with apps looking different. Distros need to maintain branding, and it seems an overreaction to a user problem. What the developers are complaining about is that they get bug reports because of themes breaking their apps, it seems it's more a problem in educating the users on where to report the issue, namely to the theme developer, instead of flat out demanding that their applications aren't themed by distros at all. There is also the problem of GDK3 not supporting theming at all, all themes being kinda hacky, whereas on GDK2 theme engines make theming without breakage perfectly usable. I encourage you to read the letter, though it's a very interesting read, even if you don't agree with what's said in it. 
Wine 4.9 was released, fixing 24 bugs, including game controller related ones and adding initial support for installing plug and play drivers, which, if I understand it correctly, should enable older peripherals to work with Wine. These fixes will probably be used by Proton as well when it updates. May 27th. Ubuntu ISOs will now ship with NVIDIA drivers included, starting from 19.10. This means anyone with an NVIDIA card and without an internet connection at the moment of install will still be able to benefit from the proprietary driver out of the box if they decided to install it. By default, the Nuvo driver will still be the one used for the live session and the installer. This addition only serves to make sure anyone that wants to use the proprietary NVIDIA drivers can. While that might ruffle a few feathers among the most hardcore free software advocates, I think it's a good move to make sure that everyone's installation and first run experience goes smoothly. May 28th. Crytype 4.2 was released, bringing a ton of new features and improvements to the leading open source drawing tool. 4.2 brings more compatibility with various graphics tablets on Windows, Mac OS X and Linux, as well as HDR painting, although on Windows 10 only, unfortunately. It also brings a vastly improved brush drawing performance and an improved color palette. A ton of other features also made the cut, such as an animation API, the ability to control file backups, the possibility to undo move operations from the history, or to move and transform selections. About a thousand bugs also have been fixed, and this makes Crytai an even better tool for digital artists and a real gem of the open source software community. May 30. D9VK, the equivalent of DXVK for DirectX 9, has seen a big new release, including a ton of bug fixes and new features that should make using it to game on older titles a lot smoother. Highlights include an entirely rewritten texture code, which should speed up rendering a lot and reduce memory usage, support for vSync and full screen mode, and support for manufacturer specific hacks and tweaks to make games work better on AMD and Nvidia hardware. A new malware has been detected on Linux, dubbed Hidden Wasp. It has been going undetected by more than 59 antivirus software, even though some of them are starting to now flag it correctly. Hidden Wasp is a full malware suite, including a Trojan, a rootkit, and a deployment script. It apparently was created last month, so it has operated for a bit before being detected. It's interesting in that it's not a death by denial of service tool or a crypto mining Trojan, but a malware created to take control of the user's machine. This kind of malware is usually limited to Windows, but this time Linux is affected, though this might mean Linux has finally become enough of a market to be worth targeting by this kind of tool. Let's hope this won't become a problem in the future. And that's it for this month. If you enjoyed, please consider liking, subscribing and turning on notifications. If you really enjoyed this video, I have a Patreon page, I'll leave a link to it in the description of the video. In the meantime, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!